My wife and I dreamed of owning the ultimate adventure rig, but with prices soaring upwards of a million dollars for earth roamers or similar builds, it fell completely out of our reach. Instead of giving up, we rolled up our sleeves, sold our sprinter van that we called home for three years, and set out to build the rig of our dreams for a fraction of the cost. Our mission became to create a home on wheels that will take us anywhere for endless amounts of time. Here's how we did it. The first step in this build was selecting a truck platform, and we chose the Ford F550 chassis cab with a 7.3 liter V8 Godzilla motor and engageable 4x4. The F550 will give us a payload of 19,500 pounds, and the gas motor will be easy to maintain and service anywhere in the world. It's also $10,000 cheaper than the diesel and 500 pounds lighter with plenty of power for our needs. Once we had the truck, the first thing we did was upgrade from the factory 32 inch dual wheels to 42 inch super singles. This significantly improved ride quality, traction and clearance while also boosting mileage. Components wise, we selected a two piece aluminum wheel, Continental MPT 81 tires and a 2.5 inch lift to accommodate the larger wheel size. Oh yeah, that thing is big. For the living habitat, we opted for a durable aluminum industrial box, measuring 14 feet long, seven and a half feet wide and tall. This will give us a much larger living space compared to the van and with square walls, it'll make the build process much easier. But the absolute coolest thing about this box is the rear drop down door, which we will be converting into a deck. So the first thing we did when starting the build was dry fitting all of the roof mounted items on the top of the box to see how it all come together. The roof itself is 14 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and we plan to use every inch of it with 1,310 watts of solar, a nomadic 3000 24 volt AC, and a max air fan. The max air fan is the first thing we are installing, and they're great because you could circulate air in or out, can be used in the rain and is on a remote, which is a huge plus since the ceilings are so tall in the box. The jigsaw is the tool of choice for cutting out the fan hole and inside we needed to use the angle grinder to cut through the oh, ceiling studs. Yeah. The fan flange fit perfectly first try, so we filed the metal shavings off and made a quick wood frame out of one by threes to give the fans fastening screws something to bite into. And then we use Dicor lap sealant to seal all around the fan flange and screw heads to protect our ceiling from water intrusion. It's in. It's in, the fan's done. You wanna unwrap it? Yeah. Before adding insulation, we also wanted to add some rigidness to the interior wall panels as well as help the echoey sound. So we picked up a roll of rattle trap sound deadening to apply to the walls and ceiling of the box. Listen to the difference. With that done, it was now time to insulate the box and we chose Havelock wool. The wool will provide an impressive R7 insulation factor and it will be extremely efficient at managing moisture that will be present in the box. And we used a 3M90 adhesive spray to stick the bats up to the walls. The next project on the roof to-do list was installing our Nomadic Cooling 3000 24 volt air conditioner. We decided on a roof mounted AC as the install is extremely simple for something like a mini split unit. So we decided to join the unit's two gauge wires to our own two gauge wires that will run to our Lynx distribution system for power. The kit actually came with a 14 by 14 metal trim ring which worked perfectly for a cut hole template and out came the trusty jigsaw and angle grinder to cut the roof hole out. This foam gasket gives the AC a nice cushiony surface to sit on, and we went around the edges with the same Dicor lap sealant as the fan install. The AC comes with these metal mounting brackets and rod bolts that basically squeeze the AC into the foam gasket and against the roof. Since we spend all of our time off grid while living on the road, solar panels are a crucial component to this truck build. For mounting the solar panels, we actually purchased these corner brackets from Home Depot, 
versus using traditional solar panel mounting brackets to save some money. First up were the smaller pairs of 175 watt solar panels and we carefully drilled the mounting bracket locations out and used a simple machine screw with washers, lock washers, and nuts with Loctite to bring it all together. The really nice thing about this box is it has a rain channel along the exterior of the roof which gives us a perfect mounting location to bolt our solar panels into. But along the interior of the solar panels, we did need to drill through the roof to bolt them down. Really though, I am not worried about potential leaks since we used lap sealant to seal these holes up really well. Now for our big panels, we will have two of these monster 490 watt residential panels on the roof totaling our solar capacity to a massive 1310 watts of solar. With the panels done, that meant all of our new roof ornaments were officially installed with literally three inches of room left to spare. That was a long two weeks of work and we're glad it's done. With the roof all done, it was time to head inside and get to work on the living space. We purchased a bunch of standard 1x3s from Home Depot and cut them up to the length we needed. These 1x3s will act as a furring strip to screw our ceiling boards into, and we used a Loctite construction adhesive paired with self-tapping screws to fasten them in. With the roof framing in, it was time to run wire for our overhead lights, and to do so, we used the Explorus Life Puck Light wiring kit, which came with 100 feet of 16 gauge stranded wire and Wago lever nuts to connect the circuit together. We are using eight 12 volt 2.75 inch Asego puck lights on a two way 12 volt dimmer. Number one, let's test it. With all of the overhead wiring done, we can now jump into installing our ceiling and we're using a half inch thick one by six pre-prime shiplap board from Home Depot to finish it all off. And for the puck lights, we used a three inch hole saw to drill out the mounting hole locations for the lights before installing it to the ceiling as well. We did need to remove some material with the jigsaw to fit the boards around our AC and fan openings, but the cuts didn't need to be perfect as they'll get covered up with the trim ring products like you see on the fan here. This is the three quarter inch sheet of Baltic birch plywood. And this is gonna also be a bed support for us. We're gonna be bolting this to the steel studs. That's how our beams are gonna sit for our bed. We are gonna be using rib nuts to bolt this entire bed structure up to the walls. And for the individual two by fours, which will support the bed platform, we are gluing and screwing them together. The two by fours notched into the three quarter inch plywood wall came out very strong. And for the bed platform itself, we are cutting up and using two sheets of half inch Baltic birch plywood. To support the front of the bed, we're using five two by fours to create an extremely strong bed structure, which are pocket screwed and glued together. And now for the floor. This was one of the cooler projects to see come together as our box came with these really nice, worn looking inch and an A thick hardwood planks. But the planks were too light a shade for our taste and had visible expansion gaps and exposed screw holes, which we did not like. So we filled the expansion gaps and screw holes with an epoxy hardener mix let that sit for a few weeks and sanded it all down. The color of choice ended up being this special walnut, and for some odd reason the instructions told us to wipe the stain across the grain. This did not work, so we ended up sanding it all down and going with the grain, which resulted in the proper finish. To top it all off, we rolled on a satin poly finish from Barathane using a fine knit nap roller, which made the floor really pop without too much of a glared up coat. Our dream has always been to have a desert tan rig and today was the day to see that dream become a reality thanks to Valley Truck Specialties in California. We really wanted the bed liner on the truck so that if we're going through tight trails since the truck is so big, it wouldn't brush up on the box and scratch anything. And here goes the first coat of bullet liner. 
The shop recommended we do a black base of bolt liner itself, followed by the color of choice on top now. Once everything was dry, I excitedly pulled the truck out and it looks absolutely insane to see it in daylight. If you are wondering why we only painted the box portion of the truck here, the paint booth was actually too small to do the entire rig at once, so we had to split the job into two. The prep process was so much more time consuming than I ever imagined it would be, but they did an incredible job making sure no bullet liner or paint would get into the cab or engine bay. And before you ask, we estimated only using 150 pounds of bullet liner for the entire rig. After four full days of these guys working non-stop on the truck, it was finally done and the end result absolutely blew our expectations out of the water. With the truck officially painted, it was now time to cut a bunch of holes in the box for our doors and windows. First up is this small turnoverland cargo door, which will act as access under our bed to the garage. We decided to make a template out of wood versus cardboard to be certain the fitment was perfect before proceeding, and then we traced the cut shape onto the box, drilled out a pilot hole to slip the jigsaw blade into, and got cutting. Fitment was perfect first try, and then it was time to construct a frame out of half inch and three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood to reinforce the box and give the door frame something to screw into. The door flange simply sits on the exterior of the box, so we applied a Loctite adhesive to glue it onto the box and screwed it into our plywood frame via the inside of the door jamb. And it was the same process for our main Turnoverland Wildlands entry door, just a much bigger cut hole size. All of our windows are also from Turnoverland, and the install process was exactly the same as well. Create a template, trace it onto the box, cut the aluminum out with the jigsaw and the inside steel studs with an angle grinder. These windows are very lightweight since they are a dual pane acrylic and we've been loving them so far. This window will be right at the foot of our bed, giving us a bird's eye view of our surroundings when we are laying down at night. We were getting very comfortable cutting holes into the box at this point. With the windows and doors all cut in and roughly installed, it was time to install our walls, which are the same half-inch pine shiplap as the ceiling. The first board starts at countertop height with some pre-cut outlet holes for things like powering our blender or charging laptops on the counter. Here I am sanding down all the wood fill used to cover up most of our ceiling screws. It was a pain in the butt, but after painting over everything with a satin eggshell white, we knew the effort was well worth it. And then we got our nomadic cooling AC faceplate up, which means all the ugly holes in our build are now covered up. These Turnoverland window covers are very nice. They have a built-in blackout shade on one side and a bug screen on the other. It is finally time to install our entire electrical system. Massive, massive thank you to Battleborn Batteries and Explorus Life for teaming up with us. The first step in building our system was constructing a quick cabinet which will house all of the system's components. I'll be briefly explaining the system install as it happens. For a distribution system, we went with dual links distributors so we have plenty of attachment points for things like our inverter, air conditioner, fuse panels, and more. Since we have two sets of solar arrays, we use this solar isolator from Explorus Life that will house each array individually. Two solar arrays mean two solar controllers as well. 
The first is the Victron 150 by 45 for the 960 watt array, and the smaller controller is a 75 by 15 for the 350 watt array. Both of these connect into our Lynx distributor to recharge our system whenever we are parked in the sun. And now for our inverter. We went with a massive Victron Quattro 5000 watt 24 volt inverter so we could run our electric oven, dual induction cooktop, and all charging outlets at the same time. To wire this beast up, we will be using the Explorus Life Quattro 24 volt 5K wiring kit. The first set of smaller wires are sending power from our inverter and to our 120 volt breaker panel. And the second set of wires is incoming shore power. These huge 4 aught stranded welding wire cables are providing the necessary power to run our inverter from our 24 volt battery bank. And to prepare for the messiest part of the install, we created a face frame that will house our 12 volt fuse panel, which is the narrower box. 120 volt breaker box, the larger box, and our Victron Orion 24 to 12 volt converter, which will step down the 24 volt power coming from our battery bank and converting it to 12 volt for things like our overhead lights, fridge, USB outlets, and more. These 120 volt breaker panels are always a pain to deal with. And the black hot wires to their respective 20 amp breakers. Using a flat 12 gauge triplex wire was the best choice for this job. To wire the batteries, we are using the Explorus Life 24 volt battery bank wiring kit with four aught wire. For power storage, we have four Battleborn 12 volt, 270 amp hour GC3H batteries tied together in a series parallel configuration. The series connection will create the 24 volt system and the parallel connection will add the amperage up for a total of 540 amp hours at 24 volts or 12,960 watt hours of battery bank storage. And here's our Victron Smart Shunt. This will be getting mounted up on the wall, directly above the master shutoff. And now for our very last black 4 aught negative cable to be connected, I first attach it to the other side of the Smart Shunt, then carefully ran it over to the last negative battery connection in our system. This is also a very good time to make sure your battery disconnect switch is in the off position. System's connected. Ready? Oh, I saw it turn on. Look. Fan, fridge, we're good. It works. Uh, we're stoked to be finally installing our entry stairs into the truck. All it took was drilling out some mounting holes so the step bracket could mount to the box, then aligning the bracket and fastening the nuts and bolts together securely. With the step support ready to go, we slid the pin and trailer pin together, pulled the steps out and got to testing it. Rose also had to jump in on the action and she pretty quickly figured out how to get up and down the steps. Considering we don't have a cab over box, there was lots of room for storage on the roof of our truck. So we headed over to Front Runner Outfitters to get a Slimline 2 roof rack installed. This roof rack is awesome because you can mount so many items up there thanks to the slotted and slotted design where we will be storing things like firewood, extra fuel and tools. Front Runner also makes this easy out awning which bolted perfectly onto the back of the truck. This will provide shade for us on those warm days when we are hanging out on the rear deck. And lastly, the other project we had sourced out on the truck. We wanted a very secure way to mount our under chassis storage boxes. We got linked up with a local welder in Yucca Valley, California, and he came up with a mixture of angle and tube steel to have the boxes sit in. We got to work using a Rust-Oleum primer, followed by black paint to seal it all off. And lastly, we got to slide our store-bought buyer's boxes into their new home. The exterior of the truck is really coming together. 
Now that the electrical installation is done, we are putting our last bed support in. We left this open during the electrical install to bring batteries in and out, and with that last beam in, we brought the half inch Baltic birch bed face we previously cut out and painted for installation. And at this point, the weather was getting hot. The footage was absolutely lacking as we were in a rush to leave, but we are building out a slatted couch design and I'm sanding everything down and sealing the wood so that it moves smoothly. Here the slats are being screwed into the longer pieces. Two of the long pieces will be stationary while the other two are what slide in and out. Nice. With the rear couch support bolted through the bed face, we brought the slatted couch base in for fitment. We actually wanted the couch lid to hinge open and closed as well. The inside of the couch will be a massive bay for our hydronic heating system later on in the build. And it comes on out and it basically takes our couch from 15 or so inches wide all the way out to 23 inches. Here we are fastening in one of the side supports. The other sides will be identical as well as the front of the couch. One, and once it was two, all done three. and put together, we had to test it out with our niece who is now calling this her bed. With the structure all done, Chrissy got to work painting the exposed plywood with the same satin eggshell paint as our walls and ceiling just to tie everything together. If you are wondering what this big stainless steel box is, it's actually our shower. We purchased five pieces of stainless steel sheets and had a local fabricator weld together a custom stainless steel shower. This was our dream shower that we so badly wanted to incorporate into the build. And he even created this awesome wood grain pattern inside of the box to match our future cabinets. Now, what are we gonna do with this open space when our rear door and deck is down? We actually decided to frame out a plywood wall with redwood 2x3s and a turn overland wildlands door to create separation from the outside world while still giving us access to our patio. This means we could sleep with our rear door down, open the turn overland door, and sleep with just the lockable screens closed, creating a lot more airflow and privacy all at once. And with the inside done, it was time to work on the outside. Since the outside will not be bearing any weight and basically shielding off the inside of the build, we simply use quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. The left side is the last piece to go in. It's nice because the quarter inch wall is extremely easy to remove. You just need to back out a handful of screws if we ever need to work on the plumbing for the shower, etc. So you may be wondering where we are. We are at the Van Smith in Boulder, Colorado. We met these guys last summer and after seeing the quality of their cabinets and their van builds, we wanted to find a way to get some custom cabinets made for our build. We actually had to create a 3D model of the cabinets and the material is all CNC cut on sheets of Baltic birch plywood and finished with the Formica pressed laminate to get the natural oak finish. The cabinet edges were very sharp upon delivery, so we used a roundover bit attached to a router to smoothen the edges out and give them a quick sand to finish it all. Alrighty, we got all the pieces lined up. We need to build this thing right here, and then we need to somehow drop it in back there. I have no idea how it's going to work. We have to build the cabinets inside the truck as they are slightly wider than our entry doors. This cabinet is our sink galley that has a bay for our trash can and gray jug three massive drawers, and a space for dirty laundry, yoga mats, and more. These cabinets are incredible because Van Smith utilizes dog bone joints into not only the cabinet carcasses, but also the drawer boxes. Basically, everything slots and tabs together for extra strength and a perfect square fit. The drawer boxes are constructed out of quarter inch plywood and simply glued and nailed together. For slides, we are using Blum undermount glides and all of the cabinets came with pre-drilled holes to fasten everything into. Click, click, that easy. These cabinets were expensive, but the time savings and high quality finish were absolutely worth the cost. We pre-installed rib nuts into the box before lifting the cabinet up and use six bolts to fasten this overhead in so it doesn't go anywhere. It's also super easy to remove if we ever wanted to. We got it! We got it! This is the pinnacle of cabinets in our build. A floor-to-ceiling, multi-tiered unit that will have drawers down below, a chest freezer, our main fridge at chest height, and more storage above. The saguaro is actually the vent for our fridge compressor. 
Our main fridge is an Isotherm Cruise 200 stainless steel and we needed some friends to help get it in because it's so heavy. This unit is epic because it has a massive fridge and freezer combo. Our very last cabinet install was also the biggest pain in the butt. We didn't have enough headroom to stand it up on the bed, so we actually needed to remove our bed platform, drop the cabinet down into the garage, and lift it straight up. Thankfully it worked out, but we were sweating it there for a second. Also, massive shout out to our buddy Chris from Dicot Designs in Boulder, Colorado. Since we were traveling at the time, we had no tools to create the last few drawer boxes. He absolutely saved our butts and helped us wrap up these odds and ends projects to complete the cabinet build. The last few projects of the build were all centered around plumbing, and we started off by installing this commercial grade stainless steel faucet into our countertop along with a massive Ruvati 19 by 21 stainless steel sink. We wanted a big sink, but not overly big that it took up too much counter space, and this one struck the bill perfectly. For plumbing lines, we opted for PEX A, and in my opinion, the absolute easiest way to run plumbing lines anywhere you want. The expansion tool is expensive up front, but absolutely worth the time savings alone. We are using half inch hot and cold water lines with brass lead free fittings. For filtration, we are using the ClearSource Ultra 3 RV filter with virus guard. We used a PEX A to 3 quarter inch male NPT, which will thread straight into the filter on the male end. For our sink drain, we used a two way ball valve with one side draining into this five gallon jug and the other side draining through a hose and straight out the bottom of the truck. Alrighty y'all, so today is the really, really big day. We are working with Aqua Hot on a full 125G gasoline hydronic heating system, so that's air through heat exchangers. We're gonna have three as well as hot water for our sink and our shower. We are getting it installed by Ross Monster Vans here in Longmont, Colorado. The first order of business was cutting out vent locations so the cozy heat exchangers would blow heat into our living space. We will have three of these heat exchangers scattered throughout the build, one in the couch blowing heat towards the shower, one in the oven cabinet blowing heat up and towards our bed, and the third is in the garage so our plumbing and electrical systems will stay warm on those freezing nights. The exhaust and air intake install was very similar to installing an S-Bar in our fan. And with the Aqua Hot screen, we can independently control any heat exchanger we want, monitor temperatures, and choose between the hydronic unit creating hot water, air, or both at the same time. The pop's gonna be going down here. The last steps to getting our plumbing up and running was installing our Rec Pro water pump and accumulator tank in our couch next to the Aqua Hot heater. There's a lot going on in this couch, but everything is very easy to access if service is ever required. We got this blank 92 gallon fresh water tank from RecPro so that we can install our own fittings on the top of the tank. We were much more comfortable going this route versus a tank with pre-installed fittings on the ground. So we installed this massive access hatch to get my arm inside the tank so I can install the Hushing fittings as well as a fuel tank sender that will tell us where our water levels are on the Serbo GX. And really quickly, here's a time lapse of our tank mounting location. We decided to build a box that will sit around the tank, allowing for expansion and contraction depending on the climate we are in. The box has been absolutely flawless for the years since we built it. 
We decided to install our fill port on the inside of the truck. So here I am drilling out a hole to mount our fill port, which was a simple on off ball valve with quick release on one side and PEX A on the other. Our PEX A on the back side will run over to our tank, which will be how we fill our water. And here's putting the shelf in, the moment of truth. I notched out a cutout so the plumbing lines can run from under the shelf and up to the inlet line. Time to wrap up our shower install. The first step being installing this drain we purchased off of Amazon into the shower base and out the bottom of the truck. For the mixing valve and shower head, we used more half inch packs to three quarter inch male NPT brass fittings for the hot and cold water lines. The shower arm fitting was a drop ear elbow with half inch pex A on the bottom to male NPT to accept the threaded shower arm. This Brondell shower head has a magnetic back that has truly withstood the test of time. It's never once Ready? fallen off while we are driving. Okay, we got a shower. Four years after moving into a vehicle, we have a shower. Well everyone, just like that, the truck build is done. This video was filmed over a full year of building while working our normal jobs and we couldn't have done it without our build partners. We learned so much throughout this process and cannot wait to hear what you all have to say about it. Stay tuned for the full tour video coming soon.